All right. Section 52 through 57. So, context of 52, we've already covered. Uh, the context is the conference held at the Morley Farm. So, DNC 52 was received at the very end of that conference. Uh, it was a bunch of mission calls. Uh, so, here we are, mission call time. A uh, ton of pairing up of missionaries. So, check out with me, section 52. The Lord says, our very next conference, this was our conference held here. So, still in alignment with section 20 that says we need to hold four conferences every year. Uh, the June conference is one example of that. And now he says, our next conference, I want to be held in Missouri, on the border by the Lamanites. Okay? And I want you to go as elders in companionships. And you see them all uh, connected here. He starts calling a bunch of companionships, like verse 22. I want Thomas B. Marsh and Ezra Thayer together. Verse 23, Isaac Morley and Ezra Booth. Verse 24, Martin and Edward Partridge. Verse 25, David Whitmer and Harvey Whitlock. What, and you notice the phrase he keeps saying is, I want you to preach by the way, preach by the way, preach by the way, verse 26, verse 27, preach by the way, so on and so forth, until they all come together into uh, one place, the place of Missouri at the border by the Lamanites. If you look at verse 33, Yea, verily I say unto you, let all these take their journey unto one place in their several courses, and one man shall not build upon another's foundation, neither journey in another's track. So spread out. Spread out. We actually can map some of these. So this map shows us some of the journeys to Missouri. So here's Kirtland. And here's Independence. So we have you know, the missionaries to the Lamanites. They're the orange one. The Colesville branch. They came to Thompson, Ohio. And we're about to see that they get kicked out of Thompson. They're going to head to Missouri that way. And you got Joseph Smith's party, which is appointed in this section, and section 53 and 5. They're the green line. They're going to go a different way. Hiram and John Murdoch's are going to take this purple route. Uh, Kirtland Camp comes later. But uh, you see them living, verse 33, spread out. Don't follow each other's tracks. I want you to preach the gospel on the way to our general, next general conference, and we will meet together uh, at that time. So, off to Missouri they go. Verse 42, if you look at this. Thus, even as I have said, if you are faithful, you shall assemble yourselves together to rejoice upon the land of Missouri, which is the land of your inheritance. Huh? What did he just say? Zion. So, remember section 48, it says, after the New York Saints get here, we will appoint a committee to go out and identify the land. He's now identified that it's somewhere in the land of Missouri. That's the land of your inheritance. Uh, it's the land of your enemies right now. It goes ahead and calls the Missourians enemies, which is not going to be good PR once they find out about that. <laughs> but uh, that's how it is. So now, uh, mean one. So let's, let's, that's, so that's 52. That's the conference that's appointed. That's where everything's headed. Meanwhile, let's go 54 and 56. These go together conceptually. And then 53 and 55 go together conceptually. So 54, we're going to talk now about this yellow line, this, the Colesville branch. So when they came from New York, they uh, went to Thompson, Ohio, which you can see is right by Kirtland. And they went to Thompson because why? Because Lehman Copley said, you guys can stay on my land, 759 acres of land. He said, I want you to go ahead and stay there. They entered into covenant of consecration. Uh, Edward Partridge was involved with consecrating uh, the land and the property and everything so that everyone was situated uh, how they needed to be. Then section 49 happened. We just saw section 49 was received for the Shakers. Lehman Copley, being very sympathetic with the Shakers, having been a former Shaker, wanted to share the gospel with the Shakers. But then, the aftermath of section 49 was not favorable, or at least it didn't go the way that Lehman Copley was hoping. So Sidney Rigdon, Parley B. Pratt, and Lehman Copley show up. And the leader of the Shakers at the time was a guy named Ashbel Kitchell. Ashbel Kitchell, he invited them in. He said, you're welcome to preach to us. And they said they had a revelation from Jesus Christ to read to the Shakers. Uh, Sidney Rigdon was super calm about it, super gentle. And he's like, yeah, we can read it at some point. If that's okay. Probably perhaps a little, uh, a little frustrated with Sidney's calm, peaceful manner. He's like, no, we have a revelation from Jesus Christ for you guys. So I'm going to read it. So, so they, they get up. I can't remember if he read it or Sidney read it. But they read it in front of all the Shakers. You can imagine how it was received. Uh, going against their doctrine in so many different ways. Uh, 
Ash Bell Kitchell says, well, everyone's essentially uh, entitled to their own opinion. Thank you. And Father B. Pratt's like, no, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. This is a call for you to repent. Ash Bell Kitchell starts to lose his cool. And he's like, well, why don't you just, you, you, you guys have overstayed. You're welcome. Now it's time to go. Father B. Pratt stands up. Sydney's like, okay, let's go. Parley's like, no. Uh, Parley stands up and he like shakes his coattails. He sh shakes his, the dust off of his coat at these guys. And says that, uh, you know, essentially, we're condemning you. Ashbel Kitchell totally loses his cool at that point. He's like, how dare you, you filthy beast? How dare you shake your coattails at me, imitating a man of God? He says, uh, he, he, say, he, he uh, accuses Parley of being guilty of lust, because Parley was married. Uh, and, then he, and, then, and then he turns, he turns upon <coughs> Lehman Copley. Okay? This is an important part of the story. He turns to Lehman Copley. He said, you knew better. You knew this was the work of God, Shakerism, and you have joined them to go after the lust of your heart. How dare you? How dare you? Lehman Copley, no pun intended, this shook him. Okay? This testimony was shaken. Uh, in Mormonism at this point, he starts to cry right there in front of everybody, and starts to question, like, kind of like, what have I done? What have I done inviting these Mormon elders to this, these good people and disrupting them this way? And his testimony starts to crumble. Uh, so, all the saints that he had promised, the Colesville saints who could live on his farm in, in Thompson, he now reneges on that. He's like, you guys have to leave. This is after 49, right? And so they're like, whoa, wait, what, what? We've made covenants and stuff. He's like, get out. Get out of my farm. Get away. And uh, so the leader of that group, Newell Knight, leader of the Colesville group, goes to Joseph Smith. He's like, what do we do about this? And Joseph's like, ah, oh, no. He inquires of the Lord. Section 54 is received. So this is... Same context for 54 and 56. It's this rebellion, the breaking of the promises of Lehman Copley. And apparently Ezra Thayer was involved, but his sin is not clear exactly what it was, but a breaking of the covenant of consecration here. And uh, and so let's let's just look at the cont uh, content, I should say content, of 54 and 56 uh, in, in this context. All right. So the Lord is not happy with Zion breakers, with, with covenant breakers. And we're going to see and watch how he deals with them. I would organize it like this. Uh, I'd invite students to mark all the knots in 56, and then we're going to go back to 54. Uh, there's a bunch of knots, and in 54, uh, 4 through 5, there's some knots, a lot of knot attitude. You can call these the, the knot heads in Zion, um, if you'd like. <laughs> That's not your style. Don't do that. <laughs> but if it is. Uh, it's kind of a fun way to look at this. Um, so the Lord, the Lord condemns uh, the non-Zion actions of Lehman Copley and Ezra Thayer. For example, um, verse 3 of 54. If your brethren desire to escape their enemies, let them repent of all their sins and become truly humble before me and contrite. Verse 4. And as the covenant which they made unto me has been broken, even so it has become void and of none effect. Covenants become void when we break them. Woe unto him by whom this offense cometh, for it had been better for him to have been drowned in the depth of the sea. Statement to Lehman Copley, right? Blessed are those who keep the covenant, etc. So here in, in section 54, he's going to tell the saints in verse 7, to go now and flee the land, lest your enemies come upon you. Flee to where? Verse 8, where are they supposed to go? They just came from New York. Verse 8, take your journey to the regions westward and to the land of Missouri, to the borders of the Lamanites. So be patient in tribulation till I come. You guys go to Missouri, where the elders were commanded to go in 52. So off they are headed there. Now, let's look at some of the not actions in 56. 56 is more specific about individuals and what they were doing to break Zion. So 56, 1 through 3. Give me some of the knots. <clears throat> Take up his cross and follow up Christ. The Lord is not pleased with those who will not take up their cross and follow me. Keep the commandments. They're not going to be saved. Verse 3. He that will not obey, not obey shall be cut off my own due time. It gets a little more interesting when you come down. So verse 8. Uh, we have pride and selfishness. That's not really a knot. But then if you get to verses 14 and 15, uh, we have uh, you are not pardoned because you seek to counsel in your own ways. Verse 15. Your hearts are not satisfied. And you obey not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. 
Uh, in fact, why don't you guys just say not when it comes up. Okay, here we go. Read along with me, verse 16. Woe unto you, rich men, that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches are going to canker your souls. And this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation, of judgment, and of indignation. You will say, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not. Woe unto you, poor men, whose hearts are not broken, whose spirits are not contrite, and whose bellies are not satisfied, and whose hands are not stayed from laying hold upon other men's goods, whose eyes are full of greediness, and who will not labor with your own hands. Uh, not, 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 not. Lots of knots, lots of uh, not Zion actions. We can talk about each of those and how they are stumbling blocks to Zion. Uh, the Lord does not look very uh, favorably upon covenant breakers, right? Uh, back in 54 when he says, the covenant you've made in me is broken. President Packer says, keep your covenants and you'll be safe. Break them and you will not. That's good. It's a good present packaging. Um, yeah. These are the kinds of things that disrupted the Zion project of the early 1830s, those kinds of attitudes. Um, remember that uh, we learned back in Moses 7 that we must have Zion people before we can have uh, and build Zion places. And the Lord is trying to get people ready to establish Missouri, to establish. He's told them that your land of inheritance is going to be over there. And clearly the people are what mess up uh, the, the places. So let's look at a few examples of these individuals. We have some little story time here. We talk about people who were Zion breakers. <clears throat> or, for example, uh, DNC 5235 puts Joseph Wakefield and Solomon Humphreys together and tells them to go east and pre or, or west preach until you get to Missouri. Uh, Joseph Humphreys is, uh, or sorry, Wakefield is one of those guys that uh, is a Zion breaker. Uh, on their way to Missouri, they stopped and preached in St. Lawrence County, New York, where Joseph Wakefield baptized George A. Smith, future apostle. Later on, George A. Smith, here he is, a man well over 200 pounds. Uh, uh, you know, St. George named after this man. So in general conference, once he used his own missionary as a bad example of Zion breaking, he, said, he told this story, he says, Joseph H. Wakefield, who baptized me after having apostatized from the church, announced to the astonished world the fact that while he was a guest in the house of Joseph Smith, he had absolutely seen the prophet come down from the room where he was engaged in translating the Word of God and actually go to playing with the children. This convinced Joseph Wakefield that the prophet was not a man of God and that the word was false, which to me and hundreds of others he had testified that he knew came from God. He afterwards headed a mob meeting and took the lead in bringing about a persecution uh, against the saints in Kirtland and the regions round about. Uh, Joseph Wakefield. Uh, so what's his problem? He doesn't like kids. <laughs> Should be a? He's a Quaker. Shaker, Shaker, Shaker. I mean. Uh, here's another one. Norman A. Brown <laughs> was on his way to Zion, Missouri. Uh, he lost the horse. His horse died. This man had been baptized for the remission of sin, rejoiced in the light of truth, started to gather with the saints, but his horse died. Now, said he, is it possible that this is the work of God? If this had been the work of God, my horse would not have died when I was going to Zion. He apostatized, fought against the work of God, and died a miserable, lingering, unhappy death. And all because of so great a trial as the loss of a horse. So, in this, uh, I see a very uh, common theme with modern uh, apostasies in people that I know. Uh, the issue is not always a horse, but the issue is always, it seems, uh, false assumptions. Right? False assumptions. If if Joseph was a true prophet, he would not play with children. If uh, this is really the work of God, my horse would not have died. Uh, we can multiply examples, right? If this really was the work of God, my grandpa would not have died. We were praying like crazy for him. And he died. This can't be true. Certain accidents would not have happened. We even prayed that no harm or accident or danger would fall upon us. And it, and it happened. My prayers would have been answered by now. There would be no uh, miracles or blessings for non-Mormons. I just watch all these really good people who aren't Mormon. And, and there's so many blessings that happen to them. They're just so good. It seems like God blesses them as much as blesses us. How is that a disqualifier? The truthfulness of the church. And Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and the Restoration and everything. It's not, right? But there's these assumptions that we have. No apostle would ever have taught a false thing ever. Uh, if, this, if this was a true church of God, then they would all be tax machines for the Lord. Right? Uh, no prophets would have ever been killed. Jesus would not have been crucified. I mean, you can get ridiculous. Right? Uh, bad things wouldn't happen to good people. 
if this is really the work of God, and on and on and on. We just have these assumptions, right? It's like the the, the leper that goes to Naaman, wait, no, Naaman, Naaman, the leper who goes to Elisha, is that right? And uh, when he tells him to go, to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan, he says, but I thought, that's a great phrase, but I thought the man of God would come out and strike the ground and bring down fire. But I thought, I have this assumption about prophets. I thought, I have this assumption about how God works and how God deals with his children. It's a great little phrase. But I thought. Uh, so it is with, with many of these apostates. Yeah, I like the word expectations too, right? Yeah. False expectations. False expectations are killer. Yeah. Strangled testimonies. Here's a few other examples. Ezra Booth, uh, section 52, he was assigned. Uh, to take his journey, preaching by the way. Here's what happens with him. He joins the church in May. The very next month he's called on a mission, so he's been a member of the church for a month. He joined the church when he saw the prophet heal the lame arm of Elsa Johnson. You know that story? Yeah. So Ezra Booth was a Methodist preacher who was a friend of the Johnson family. They're not members of the church yet. Elsa Johnson has a lame arm, hasn't been able to, to do laundry or do anything, hang clothes up on his clothesline for years. Uh, they're in conversation there. Edward Partridge's house, and Ezra Booth is kind of pounding around with them. And the conversation turns to uh, miracles of the New Testament. And someone says, in your shot of Joseph in that room, in kind of a parlor of Ezra, Edward Partridge there, they said, uh, I wonder, you know, wonder if anyone on earth right now has the power of God like in Old Test or the New Testament times. People to be able to, to like heal, for example, Elsa Johnson's arm. Do you think there's anyone on earth today that can do that? Conversation went on, you know, Elsa Johnson. By the way, Elsa's, that's a name that's starting to come back, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so Joseph, when the conversation had moved to another topic, he just quietly walked across the room, grabbed Elsa Johnson by the arm and said, Elsa, or he's, I think he just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to be whole. And then he walked out. And all the conversation, like, well, that was a stop. And everyone's like, looks at Elsa. And she does this. She does this. And they're like, whoa. The next day she's hanging laundry. And Ezra Booth's like, I'm in. I am in. That is legit New Testament miracles. The way she was able just to let it go, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where before that, it seemed like it was frozen. You know, she, she could oh, <laughs> You know, I was really tempted, sorry, to ask, pres <laughs> sorry, <laughs> President, uh, uh, iring to like my dad has a bad limp. Oh, I almost said it. I was like, do you mind? You know, could you heal him? You, you know, they promised yeah, they can heal like that. So, uh, what, what kept you back? Uh, huh? I know, I don't know, man. Help my own help that one. <laughs> <laughs> Is this at all related to John Johnson Farm or anything like that? This Elsa Johnson. Yep, yep. That's that's Sister Johnson. Yep. So married to John Johnson. John Johnson's wife. That's right. So they're going to join the church right about this time as well. So Booth, along with other missionaries, is called to send to Missouri. This is his mission call. Um, and uh, so he, his expectations were not met. He was upset about having to walk and preach the entire journey. That's what the Lord commanded him to do. He had to preach along the way, preach along the way, so keep preaching along the way. It's like, I hate that. He began to criticize and find fault with the leadership of the church. Uh, he was disappointed when he actually arrived in Missouri and did not experience miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. Because I thought, when I got to the land of inheritance, I would see heroes. And what did I see? Nothing. A bunch of backwards people, criminals on the edge of society that are ready at any moment to hop across the border into Lamanite territory as soon as any U.S. Marshals come to take them out. You know, it's like, I didn't see anything. No miracles. So, oh, down backward people. That's all I saw. Wasn't very nice, that's right. But uh, that's really no miracles. Here's another one. Simon's writer. You like him, huh? Uh, that he's in section 52, verse 37. So I'd like just to show up, show all these people in section 52 that have these interesting stories. Did you spell his name right? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Good I can't remember how to say his So he was a Campbellite minister. He comes into the church because of Ezra Booth's testimony about Joseph, what he saw him healing the arm of uh, Elsa Johnson, they both come to the church that way. Uh, he's baptized early in June. He's ordained an elder-ish right there, we think. Uh, called to replace Heman Bassett in his mission, 237. He-man. He, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, joins with his fellow apostate and mentor Ezra Booth to stir hatred against the Mormons okay. in the summer. So he has like this 
this period here, when he was somewhat faithful, he actually doesn't go on his mission. Uh, Simon's writer returns to the Campbellite congregation. He's like Alexander Campbell. He's one of the Campbellite people that Sydney Rigan used to be. And they're also called the Disciple Church by this time. Uh, he becomes a Campbellite minister. So he has this like three month stint with Mormonism. He continues to fuel hatred and persecution against Mormons, especially in Hiram, Ohio, by the Johnson farm. Because of him, there's the tarring and feathering of Joseph and Sidney. And Sidney gets his head bashed in so bad. So bad. And Joseph's twin, one of the twins dies, right? And the other one gets really sick. Uh, so here's, why, why does he leave the church? Famous, right, famous story. Here's the actual manuscript. Joseph Smith papers. There it is, can you see it? Let's zoom in on that. Ah, shoot! Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> left out the I altogether. Simon, S-I-M-O-N-D-S-R-I-D-E-R. -E How do you spell Simon's writer? That's a Y. That's a Y, man. He said his name was spelled R-I-D-E-R -E instead of R-Y-D-E-R. And he thought if the spirit, through, he thought, expectations, assumptions, he thought that if the spirit through which he had been called to preach could err in the matter of spelling his name, he might have erred in calling him to the ministry as well. So he actually doesn't even leave on his mission. In fact, as everyone leaves on their missions to go to Missouri, he hangs back. And this is what he discovers. With all the leaders gone, he can now like, do some investigative work. This is his own... His own... Uh, <laughs> what's that? Oh, did I misspell? Shoot. Okay, so anyways. Uh, it says... Uh, <laughs> In his own in his own record, <laughs> it says when they Joseph Smith uh, and party went to Missouri to lay the foundation of the splendid city of Zion, tripping with sarcasm, and also the temple, they left their papers behind. <laughs> this gave their new converts an opportunity to become acquainted with the internal arrangement of their church, which revealed to them the horrid fact that a plot was laid to take their property from them and place it under the control of Joseph Smith the prophet. What's he talking about? What did they discover? Consecration. Okay. It's like, yeah, it's in DNC 42. Wait, right. So it's, uh, it's like, <gasps> we've discovered something. There's a plot to have us give our. Hmm. So, but there's the irony of Simon's writer's story. He's, <laughs> He's actually buried in, uh, right by Hiram, Ohio, in the cemetery. I think it's in Hiram, Ohio. Uh, here's me at that. Yeah. <laughs> His name is actually spelled S Y M O N. <laughs> The S R Y D E R, but what's I think is more important is, can you see this? He was an elder of the D E C I P L E church. They misspelled disciple. So the lesson I like to share with my students is be a disciple, not a disciple. Okay? Be a full disciple, not a disciple. Anyway, uh, when uh, Stefan and I were at BYU, uh, doing some of uh, the rotation, I noticed this horrid fact. <laughs> they misspelled my name at BYU. Who chairs BYU's church board of education? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I said that's fine. My, my wife's patriarch of blessing. Uh, patriarch misspelled her, her name. Mine's, my mom's name. Really? And your mom's name? And we could. I don't believe in. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after all this. All right, after all this. Yeah, yeah. confirmed it. Come out. Yeah, I heard the president uh, Hinckley's locker in the Salt Lake Temple. It had like the brethren's names on them. They spelled his name without the C. Just Hinckley. K, no C. Someone pointed it out many years later to him, and he's like, oh. That's the end of that story. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know. Let's do, let's do some good examples. Let's do a good example. And that gets us to section 53. Go to section 53 now. So we've gone over some of the not heads and some of the not Zion attitudes, some of the, the Zion breaker attitudes. Now let's flip it over to those who are actually good examples of this. 53 and 55 go together in that way. So, so this man, uh, Sidney Gilbert's first name's Algernon. Algernon Sidney Gilbert. Uh, the Lord just calls him Sidney Gilbert in verse one. So, wouldn't you? Uh, so here's uh, here, here's what he. This is when he's called to be a church agent in Zion. Uh, we don't have a picture of Algernon Sidney Gilbert because he's going to die pretty early on. Uh, 
but he is going to, so when it says Newell, Newell K. Whitney store, it says Whitney and Company. He's the end company. And then he's going to be called to Missouri here in this section. And he's going to establish the Gilbert Whitney Company there. That store, so he's like a, a, a grocery store guy, uh, he's going to become the Missouri equivalent of the Newell K. Whitney store, which when you add that to the printing uh, project of the literary firm, those three together will become the United Firm that we talked about later on. So this is where he comes into the picture, section 53. Um, so 1817, he's called, or he was a resident of Painesville, Ohio, where he owns a small store. From 1820 to 27, he's an entrepreneur buying and selling properties in Ohio, Michigan. And he had commercial interests and trading centers near Lake Ontario and Erie Canal. By 1827, uh, him and Newell Whitney had entered a mercantile partnership, opened a small store in the name of Newell K. Whitney and Company. Uh, Sidney lives only four years after his baptism. He's ordained an elder on the 8th of June, 1831. Hey, what's the date of this section? June. That's right. This is the 8th of June, so he's going to be ordained an elder right after this. Why? Because, verse 3, the Lord says, Take upon you my ordination, even that of an elder, to preach faith and repentance for remission of sin. So he'll, he'll get that done right after this section is received. In obedience to DNC 57, verse 8, uh, later on, once he goes to Missouri, the Lord establishes him as, let's go to 57, 57, 8. The Lord tells him, he plants him, he says, he uses the word plant. Uh, once they're in Missouri, I plant uh, my Sidney, Silbert, Sidney Gilbert, let him plant himself in this place and establish his store that he may sell goods without fraud, that he may obtain money to buy lands for the good of the saints, and that he may obtain whatsoever things the disciples may need. Disciples spelled correctly there. Uh, to plant them in their inheritance. Um, he will be called, over in verse 15, the agent of the bishop, the bishop and the agent which is in back in 53 as well. He's called to be in verse 4. Let's bounce around. Go back to 53, verse 4. Uh, highlight the word agent. He's called to be the agent unto the church, the agent of the bishop. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about his, uh, the aftermath. We'll come back to this agent business. On June, 29th of June, 1834, on Zion's camp, cholera took the life of Algernon Sidney Gilbert. He dies there. Now, the backstory of this is like super interesting. He dies of cholera, but... Uh, he was, he had an Achilles heel, apparently. Uh, he was faithful in many things. At one point, he, along with Isaac Morley, offered their life as ransom for the fellow saints in Missouri. He's awesome, great man. But he lacked confidence in one thing, in his ability to preach the gospel. And he died soon after turning down a mission call. The prophet Joseph commented on Brother Gilbert's turning down his mission call and on his subject, uh, subsequent death by saying, he had been called to preach the gospel, but had been known to say that he would rather die then go forth to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, Heber C. Kimball says there's a man who got what he asked for. Um, so, that's interesting. Uh, let's go back to <laughs> let's go back to 53. So, the church agent, he's called to be the church agent. What is the church agent? The agent in this usage is the person who is authorized to act for another person. He's the agent of the bishop. Sidney Gilbert is to be Bishop Partridge's agent to transact church business related to the law of consecration with Bishop Whitney, right? So either Bishop Whitney, no, not Whitney, but Partridge, Bishop Partridge could do it, or he could ask Sidney Gilbert to do it, and he was an authorized agent of the bishop. Those verses talk about the, the uh, bishop's agent. So here is the man. The office was created prior to the man appointed to the office. That's when he first talks about it. Then he gets a man to do it. Then he plants him in Missouri, and he's off and running, helping out Bishop Partridge. 55, we meet a fellow named W.W. W. Phelps. He was not yet baptized, but he uh, came to Joseph and asked him, what, uh, what is the Lord's will concerning me? And the Lord says, no surprise in verse 1, step 1, get baptized. Step 2, be ordained an elder under the hands of my servant Joseph to preach repentance and remission of sins. <coughs> Verse 4, I know you're a printer. I want you to be appointed to work with Oliver Cowdery to do the work of printing, selecting, writing books for schools in this church so that little children may receive instruction before me as is pleasing unto me. So go with Joseph. He actually connects W.W. Phelps with Joseph and Sydney's party to leave Kirtland and travel down to Missouri together. So he goes with Joseph. Phelps is an interesting guy. 
uh, we know that in the late 1820s, 1830s, he's a publisher, editor of a newspaper, uh, and he resigned that editorship to join the church. He becomes the church printer in Missouri, pointed right here. Uh, there he's going to print the first copy of the Book of Commandments, the first church newspaper called the Evening and Morning Star. In 1833, he'll offer himself to a Missouri mob as a ransom for the saints. Uh, after the Missouri expulsion, he'll return to Kirtland. He helps prepare the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. He, reserves, er, he serves as Joseph's scribe in the translations of the Book of Abraham. Uh, he prints the first hymn book. He authors 15 of those hymns in the hymn book. Can you name a W.W. Phelps up? A lot of choice. A bunch of them, right? A lot of our favorites. Um, so he offers, he does, he does 15 of those. Those are the, some of the favorites in the church, right? So he's got a pretty, pretty sweet little gift there. So, uh, so Seth, you mentioned off camera that uh, sometimes people get called in wards to uh, play the organ for the ward because they have a skill at playing the organ. The Lord, it was the Lord's will, it's clearly here, verse 4, the Lord, I want you, W.W. W. Phelps, to use the skills you have developed as a printer to be a printer. I want you to use those skills in Zion to build Zion. Consecrate your talent to the building up of the kingdom of God. Here. That's what I'm calling you to do. Right. So, now let's go to let's go to Zion. So they travel from Kirtland to Missouri, and they locate they locate the city Zion. And uh, 57 is where it happens. They go to the borders of the United States, Independence, Missouri. Right across the border is, you know, uh, Indian territory is what they call it. And Joseph says he he brought these questions before the Lord. When will the wilderness blossom as the rose, which section 48 mentioned? When will Zion be built up in her glory? Where will thy temple stand, unto which all nations shall come in the last days? Our anxiety was soon relieved by receiving the following. So this is now he's in Missouri, walked around Independence, kneels down, prays. This is this is the answer. So, uh, oh, he also says. Well, let's just, so first, section uh, 57 is going to co gonna cover this first question. Section 58 is going to cover uh, the, the first question, when will Zion be built up? So we'll kind of take them separately. So where, the where is right here. Uh, verse 3 tells us what? It says it's good, quite, good, good question. It's over, right over by, uh, by the courthouse. It's westward upon a lot not far from the courthouse. Here's the courthouse. It's going to be west of the courthouse in a, in a, in a lot there. And so, very specifically, <clears throat> right? Uh, and by the way, verse 2, this is the land of promise, the place for the city of Zion. So now he has fulfilled his promise that he gave back in section 48 that the group of elders will go over and he'll reveal it to him. So now he's fulfilled that promise right here. Uh, this is the center place. This is the place. I want the temple west of the courthouse. So they're going to appoint this place. Joseph Smith will help draft uh, the 1833 city plat for the New Jerusalem. So this happens. There was another one, and then this is like a revised version. They, they drew one up. I think it was just a few months after they got back from this trip. And then about a year and a half, two years later, they drew up this version of the city plat. Um, You'll notice what's here in the middle? The temple squares. These are, these are temples. Yeah, they're actually temple squares. There's actually, yeah, good. And these are blocks. They go out from the temple. The, 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 this is the Zion City plat pattern that the saints are going to use for a ton of their cities uh, up and down Utah, right? So here's somebody. It's, uh, that has gone through every one of these blue squares is a city in Utah that is patterned after the Zion pattern of having a uh, temple or a church center in the middle and everything patterned out of that. So, so Salt Lake is probably the most famous, right? But did you know Bountiful is as well? Did you know Spanish Fork is? Wait, what? What's the center place in Spanish Fork? What's that? 
December twenty. It's that cultural hall thing on the corner, right? Yeah, where? And the library? No, it's the library there. No. The old red Olive Garden. Yes, it's on the, it's on the <laughs> south. Olive Garden. It's on the south uh, west corner. It's like an old building right there. It's Good. a city building now, isn't it? Yep. What it used to be. Yeah, uh, Provo. Provo has that, but it's not, the it's not the Provo Temple. Yeah, it was the Tabernacle originally, which is now the Temple, so that's pretty cool. So it's like a church center or a temple. Um, but you can notice up and down the I-15 corridor, there's just all kinds of... It's the... It's the Zion pattern. So Brigham Young took this and ran with it among the saints here. Um, so here's the uh, more revised, revised one. And uh, let's, let's zoom in on this. Okay, there we go. Let's bring this over here. Perfect. Okay. So what you actually notice is. Oh, shoot. Oh, oh. Finally, finally, maybe bit the dust. Hey, welcome back from our previous <laughs> dilemma. What, what was that? Technical malfunction. Uh, so, where were we? Oh, yeah. Over there. Zooming over there. Okay. So, you'll see in the uh, revised city plat, there are 24, it's like a complex of 24 temples, uh, or 24 buildings. Um, some of them seem to be kind of in the, well, they all kind of seem to be the same kind of building, right? They all kind of have that peak little roof. Um, here is John John Hammer, um, who uh, used to be a member of the church. Now he's a member of the Church of Community of Christ. Uh, anyway, so he he like digitally enhances this. Uh, it's likely that one of them would be kind of the temple, like the temple temple. Um, but then there would be like multiple. So it'd be like church office buildings. Maybe there's an Aaronic priesthood temple, a Kesley priesthood temples. Perhaps the sons of Levi would offer an offering of the Lord in righteousness in the Aaronic Priesthood Temple. We don't know all the details for sure. There is speculation about these kinds of things. Um, so what's interesting is if you get the plat that's, that Joseph Smith uh, and, and committee put together and you overlay it on the city like that, you'll notice that, that pretty much uh, would destroy what was then Independence, Missouri. The natives of Independence, Missouri didn't like this plan. They didn't, they didn't think that was a good idea. So there's going to be one among many things that's going to turn the Missourians against the Mormons. Basically, they're here to conquer us, drive us out, or cause us to join them. And uh, their idea is to destroy everything that we've built up. It's just a small little town at that time. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, the plat doesn't really jive with our current situation. And so, this, yeah, this will be a, a point of conflict. This will be a point of conflict. Now let's uh, let's zoom in here on the uh, temple parcel. If you zoom in here, the current standing of that temple parcel is this: we got Community of Christ yeah. that owns a little slice of the pie. Uh, LDS Church owns a piece of that Church of Christ temple lot. Community of Christ over there as well. Hmm. If we zoom in like that, you can see so that this like road right there is this road right here. Even the U United Nations have a little slice of the pie. There's a UN peace monument there, literally. It's like this girl dancing. <laughs> so there it is. So we, we got this, this, the stake center and visitor center. That's our portion. You can see this other stuff, right? So that's the current, this current status of kind of the aftermath of DNC 57 uh, of uh, uh, the center place of Zion right here, appointed by the finger of the Lord in uh, this section. Um, yeah. And so the saints now have an exact location of where to gather, right? But it needs to be done in wisdom and in order, and it needs to be done with a bishop's recommend to go to design. You're not supposed to go unless you are commanded by the Lord to do so in an orderly fashion. Uh, if you notice these individuals that are named in section 57, Sidney Gilbert, Edward Partridge, Sydney again, W.W. W. Phelps, Oliver Cowdery. Uh, each of these are invited to be to be planted. Plant yourself, be planted, plant. Uh, the Lord's going to plant them there. And uh, he's going to appoint them for specific missions. Here are the, the their skills and former careers. So Edward Partridge was a merchant who sold who owned a business and sold hats. Sidney Gilbert, also a successful merchant. Printer, writer, editor, publisher, 
who had worked for newspapers before, Oliver Cowdery, talented writer, editor, speaker, taught school, practiced law. Um, so again, we see that the Lord uses the gifts and talents that people already have, puts them to work to help build Zion in a way you know, that they are uniquely uh, fitted for. So I think that's uh, a cool way to think about, you know, as, you, as we con think about our own consecration. Uh, sometimes we talk about church callings as they're meant to make us grow or help us learn skills we don't already have, and sometimes that might be true. But there's also a whole other side of things where the Lord's like, no, I want people who are already good at X, Y, or Z to come in and use those gifts to bless, right? Certainly there's, there's truth on both sides of that spectrum. Uh, Elder Bednar talked about this. He says, he says, consecration includes and encompasses sacrifice and much more. We are not only willing to offer up our possessions, but we will become the best we can be. We develop ourselves in skills and assist, however possible, in building the kingdom in righteous ways. We will not only die for the gospel, but we will develop ourselves and live for the gospel. These are men who are already pretty well developed, and they're going to continue to develop their skills and their abilities. And uh, just great examples of, of consecration. So... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the essence of 57. Any thoughts, comments, questions that you have uh, on 57 before we, before we wrap up this segment, 52 through 57? Okay.